So that was a crazy week. Was was just absolutely bonkers. So Bob Goldberg out, acquisition of Follow Up Boss by Zillow, the news out of Kansas City from the court, the verdict was absolutely crazy. And I, we were just chatting about this. I went straight to the finance thing. I was like, oh, it could be five billion dollars, not two. And you're like, that that doesn't matter. So tell me what you were just saying. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't that it doesn't matter. It's like trouble damages are already like automatic, right? So, um, but no, what I was saying or what I think is the most relevant thing out of the verdict is we still have to wait for the final judgment, right? For the the rulings of law to be put into writing by the, the district court judge. Um, and so I think that's when, when we're really gonna know what any of this means. Cause you know, I was talking to Brad Inman last week on um, Inman Connect and we we're talking about how there's really just more questions and answers right now because we just don't know. Like, yes, we have a verdict. Yes, they, you know, found for the plaintiff, but what does that mean? Like, what's the rule of law? Like, what is this, what does all this mean for our industry? Because I know everyone's just thinking, oh, well, whatever, nothing's going to change because we're going to be in appeal process, in the appeal process. But that doesn't mean that there's not going to now be a precedent set, right? Whether it's persuasive, um, you know, or or binding, we don't know yet. We have to see like, what does this judge say? What is the new precedent? What is, or what is the new ruling? You know, is cooperation going to now be made illegal, right? Um, what does that mean? So until we have- that Is that a possibility? Like, do you think that's a realistic possibility on the on the scale? Um, I think a, if, the, if the judge determines based on the law that cooperation, violates antitrust then that could be a ruling of law i don't know that he's going to say that i don't know how he's going to interpret what all has happened and the facts you know as as he sees them right he's but once we have that from him he's got to justify it he's going to write it up right it's going to be in writing the um the defendants can't appeal until they have that final judgment um they get to influence and request you know um, a reduction in damages, like there's a lot of things that get to kind of now happen just, you know, from a legal standpoint that we're still TBD to be determined. <laughs> so uh, once we get that stuff kind of settled out, then we'll, we'll know like what's changed. And then people have to understand like those changes go into effect potentially immediately, depending on like what he says and how he says it. Right. So once we know that, then we go forward. So that timeline for when we get that final piece of the puzzle before yeah. they can appeal is this next week or this week we're we're in or how is that? Yeah, well, hopefully we will hear um, from the judge, you know, within the next five day, business days or so, you know, I mean, he's probably furiously putting that together with his research team, you know, his interns and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, justifying what he's saying, right? Um, but yeah, that it's not until we have that document that, um, the defendants can even appeal because they need to know exactly like what they're appealing. Right. Um, and then the appellate court isn't going to be looking at it like as a new trial, there's no new jury or anything like that. It's just looking, you know, at it more academically, right. They're going to look at it from an academic logical perspective. Like was the law applied correctly? Did the judge um, you know, make any mistakes. Cause like people have to understand too, like the difference between the appellate court and like a trial court is a trial judge has to make decisions like fast, right? They, they don't get a ton of time to research and really think about um, all the things before that they make decisions. They have to do them quickly in the moment, you know um, it's a different skill set sure. that they have in a trial court scenario. So of course, mistakes can be made, right? A judge can make a ruling, you know, and it maybe not be applied correctly just because they have to move fast. They're reacting. Whereas, you know, the appellate court gets to look at it all. They get time to marinate on it. They, you know, they have, I won't say limitless time to review it, but, you know, they have substantial time to review everything. And like, they get that hindsight 2020 kind of mm -hmm. opportunity to look at all the, you know, the transcripts and things like that um, before making decisions. So it's just... It's just a different type of process, but 
you know, not everything is appealable, right? <laughs> there has to be sure. an error, mode, right? It's not just, oh, I, I disagree with your opinion. It's more like, um, you know, was it actual error made, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so I'd love to get to I'd love to get to, to what you think is going to really come out of this. Like if if you were to use your best guess, um, but it's just so awesome because there's lots of us that have been in the industry for a long time that have a grasp on the industry. But then when you take it to this level and add the legal layer, <clears throat> I mean, there's not many people with your skill set that can say, "Oh, well, I understand both pieces of this puzzle, and here's here's how it's going to go." And that, that's why it's awesome to chat with you and and you have your expertise. Uh, available to share because people are losing their minds and uh, there's false information out there all over the place and people yeah. making guesswork and and throwing stuff on the wall. Yeah, well, I mean, I was never an appellate attorney. Um, I was a trial attorney at one point, um, but never an appellate attorney. So I don't have like a ton of experience with that outside of what you learn in law school, right? Um, and that was 20 years ago for me when I graduated. <laughs> So civil procedure was not my favorite topic. In okay, law fair enough. I, 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 I muscled through it uh, with, with decent grades, with good grades. I shouldn't say decent, yeah. I was a student. But anyway, um, but yeah, like, uh, I, I think that, you know, the biggest thing is that people are going to have, you know, well, let me answer your question. What do I think my best guess is going to happen? My husband, I, of course, he's also a lawyer. We talk about this kind of stuff all the time, right? Um, oh, what's dinner time has got to be thrilling, yeah. <laughs> oh my, it's, it's 24 seven, Chris. Like, <laughs> dinner time. like <laughs> and we even get to eat dinner together, right? But like, um, it's what we think both kind of, I think, lean towards things happening. One, we do think change is going to happen. If not for no reason other than people who are outside of the day-to-day -day operations of real estate are the ones participating in this entire conversation, right? So, I mean, tell me when the last time Gary Keller or, you know, actually sat in a living room to do a listening conversation, if ever, right? right? Like, right. It's been a long time. You know, people like that at that level, you know, all these CEOs of these companies, they've been out of the game, most of them for quite some time. They're in leadership. It's a it's a different world in leadership than being, you know, in the day-to-day -day grind of selling real estate. And then so you have that. And then of course you have the attorneys who also have no practical experience with what it's like, boots on the ground, you know, helping buyers and sellers every day and and what the challenges are. Right. So you have people who are in leadership participating in this conversation who really don't understand. And then you have, and so there's a lack of passion in my opinion. And I think that's what, I think his name was Catchmark, the plaintiff's attorney, what he did have in spades, right? It was was a ton of passion about this, right? And mm -hmm. used very strong language and was just very polarizing, but he did that on purpose because he was tapping into emotion. And we all know how emotional the real estate experience is, especially on the residential side. Sure. And so when you, you have full motion emotion with less emotion or yeah. very lot, right? Like I'm sure the defense attorneys were very logical and practical in their arguments. Um, so the jury was swayed by emotion because they're like, holy cow. Right. Probably. I mean, yes. Like the, the emotion will trigger a different kind of like radar of, of attention. Right. So you talk to high level to someone about something, you know, and, and you don't draw in the emotion, it's boring. They're not Got connected it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. emotion to the topic. So, um, so you have that, and then you have, you know, people who, again, who are outside of the industry, who also know really very little outside of the experience, like making the decision. So, you know, I, I feel like that's something's going to change. All right. So there's that. So, um, then not only that, I think what, could potentially happen is it's probably going to um, get, you know, be legislated. Just like how lawyers are, you know, there's laws around how much money attorneys can make, you know, what they make on contingency fees, going to trial, things like that. I, I, my husband and I suspect there'll probably be some sort of legislation oh. because there'll be so much confusion on like what it is and what it isn't and what should be charged and what can't be charged. I I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see, you know, people just the, the, the 
the legislation um, come down that just says like, hey, this is what it's going to be going forward. Um, and then it'll be regulated. I mean, people, you know, give lawyers a hard time, but if you've ever, like, there's a lot of lawyers that go through the education and actually end up not practicing law because it's so highly, you know, um, legislated and like, you know, even our advertising rules. I mean, like literally if we want to send a mailer out, we have to stamp in Florida, we have to stamp a red stamp on the front of the letter says advertisements, sending it out to the customer. Well, who's going to read that? No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> lawyers, like a lot of us use the, the phone book and commercials to drive business because we couldn't solicit. Yeah. Right. So there's like, you know, for, for how bad people think about us, we have a ton of rules around how lawyers can behave, what they can do, how they can get business, um, you know, how much they can make, you know, in some cases. And, uh, you know, I could- Do you I, see parallels? Could, I'm sorry, go ahead. Going that direction. Yeah. Do you see parallels to the post great financial crisis and the mortgage industry regulations that kind of came into to effect in the years thereafter and and this situation now? That's an interesting point that, I mean, there it is that happened, right? So <laughs> um, you could see that happen in the, in the real estate space too, um, especially since there's such a, a care for the consumer, you know, and so in trying to care for the consumer, we try to create protections and regulations to protect them from being taken advantage of, being mm -hmm. overcharged, things like that. Um, but you know what? the mortgage industry didn't have that, you know, real estate industry does have is NAR, right? Right. <laughs> and, right. Um, you know, NAR, I think has protected the real estate industry, you know, very well. And for a long period of time, for a long time. and for the first time, it that's somewhat being dis potentially dismantled, um, mm -hmm. or at least challenged. Um, and so we'll see. I mean, if, if we, if we lose some of that political power, a lot can change for the industry. Well, and that's, I mean, that's, that political power comes from donations to our PAC, right? And the, the super, super PAC that is driven by the donations of members. And if you're in an association and you don't have to be a member of NAR now, and you're not attending those fundraising events and like, and membership drops because they're not getting the dues because I mean, the whole thing is kind of built on this foundation and it's, I'm, I'm kind of questioning it. Yeah. Well, I mean, agent support matters. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. And agent and broker support. And so if you start to lose agent and broker support at really high levels, I mean, it'll be interesting between Redfin, Remax and anywhere. If they, you know, Redfin is saying they're, they're, debundling or detaching right um between yeah. from nar um if you start to see remax broker owners because i mean remax corporate can't do anything in and of itself um but it's the the broker owners right that are yeah. going to be you know given opportunity to make these kinds of choices and you know it's it's going to be tough because a lot a huge percentage of the mls is not all but a huge percentage of them are directly connected with NAR. Yeah. And so, but I know like my MLS Stellar allows you to be at what's called a Thompson broker, which um, means that you don't have to be an affiliate of NAR, right? Which excuses the fees, but you do still have to uphold the standards, the code of ethics and the rules, yep. right? So, um, and it's a different fee <laughs> um, that you pay, right? So I don't know that it's necessarily cheaper. Um, per se, because I don't know what the fee is in, at, for my particular MLS, because I've always been a, a participant, um, an AR uh, member. Um, so, you know, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, if you start to see independent brokerages, yeah, anywhere franchise owners, Remax franchise owners start to separate, you know, those are some of the bigger, you know, local companies, there could be impact. I, yeah, I, I feel but like if, impact is. But if, if Remax broker owners and anywhere broker owners don't change anything, then they, you know, it becomes a moot, you know, stipulation in that settlement agreement, right? Because you can say they don't have to affiliate, but if no one actually 
you know, disassociates, it, it has no impact. No there, there's going to be some impact and there will be a reduction in revenue coming in and NAR, um, um, Lawrence Yoon, uh, already mm -hmm. changed and came out and said, look, we're raising dues because we think there's going to be, uh, implications, uh, for membership down in, down the road. So there's going to be a reduction and, and also, you know, recession, right? Whenever there's recession, there's fewer members. So, um, we've seen that happen time and time again. Yeah. But uh, they're not going away. NAR is not going away. It's just a reduction is is what's going to happen. I wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, has NAR peaked? And that was before this came out. And I was like, oh, I think I think that's the kind of a good way to think about it at this point. But uh, OK, yeah. it's interesting. I don't know if you read that Inman article, but one of those research mm -hmm. companies um, basically they before, again before the verdict came out said that hey we think that there's going to be a significant reduction in the number of members right yep. of NAR and so um i think this i think i saw somewhere that there's like 4 million licensees in the country but 1.6 million are real tours right like yeah, NAR that's tours. about right um and so you know what does that mean for us well a huge you know it's like a j curve um for uh real estate professionals, meaning there's like the majority of NAR members and licensees actually don't sell houses or sell one to right. max two, right? Yeah. If you make it more expensive to be a participant, a lot of people are just going to choose not to do it, right? Correct. Not to participate, not to um, incur the expense. Not to mention you have all these new people getting in who haven't realized how difficult the industry is yet, you know, right. um, to, to build a business. So, um, but anyway, in this report, they were saying how they anticipate a, like two thirds of members getting out. Oh, and, I thought a third is what I was thinking. Wow. In what time yeah. period though? Um, I, I don't remember if they gave okay. a time period, but he also said um, from their research based on the amount of business being done in the U S compared to the number of licensees and the number of and the number of homes sold in other countries, we should only have about 300 to 600,000 members. Yeah. Right. To support the level of um, productivity. Yeah. Right. Because like, you okay. know, we, we did business in Australia for some time, not with revaluate pre previous company. And I think their average was 60 transactions per agent a year, their average, just mm. like that's far and above anything. <laughs> well, yeah, they probably charge a lot less yeah. per transaction, yeah. right? And so, but in that, it has to create a decent living, a decent, decent wage, right? Yeah. For it to be worthwhile. Um, and right now, people are allowed to have full time jobs and still have a license, sell one or two houses, you know. And that's going to also be up to the consumer to determine, like, who do they want to work with? Do they want to continue working with someone who's only going to sell one or two houses a year? Or do they, would they rather work with someone who's sold 10, 12, 20, 50, 100? Right? Yeah. Which is why I think teams are still going to continue to thrive. Yes, I agree. I think teams are in a, are well positioned for that. Um, I, I was a big fan of the raise the bar movement back in the day, and that sort of fizzled, um, I think. But uh, that's that idea of more education, fewer fewer uh, participants uh, feels like the right direction for the consumer uh, mm -hmm. and for the industry. So I, I kind of, if that happens, I don't think that's a, a bad situation. Okay, last, last thing I want to ask you, um, and this is awesome. Thank you, Kendall, so much. Um, should agents be making agents, teams, brokers, brands be making gigantic changes right now, or should they uh, not make any changes or somewhere in between? Uh, I don't think anyone should do anything until we find out what the judge says. Yeah. Because <laughs> you don't know what to, what to do, yeah. right? Who knows what he's going to say, you know, what his findings are going to be. But once we have that, I think that's going to help direct the changes. But I shouldn't say it shouldn't make any changes. I think there is one, to me, it's not a big change, gen, like big picture wise, but it is from a industry standard um, okay. position, which is, and I said it, I'm in it. You know, I think that now more than ever, we need to get more consultative about real estate, meaning stop taking a lead and having a lead call and going, showing, going to show a house. Stop 
have a meeting, have a consultation, <laughs> find out what they're looking for, find out more information about them, build that rapport, build that trust, um, build that relationship, and then, you know, introduce the value that you can bring to them beyond opening doors. You know, I think that's part of the problem is that a lot of agents and, and I hear from people who are Zillow uh, flex participants, right? Like Zillow also has in there, like, we don't want you asking a bunch of questions. If they want to say house, just go show them a house. That is like, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and I'm just like, really? So Zillow doesn't want you. They want to remove friction, right? They want this frictionless environment. But the problem with frictionless is there's no value being driven. There's no, like, if, without pain, there's no, like, value, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, right? Like, we have to, we have to drive the pain in order to drive the game, right? So um, I think that like removing friction is the thing that we've always strived to do, which is the thing that's hurting the industry. Whereas if we, you know, build up the friction, meaning build up the pain for the consumer, like, listen, if you don't have someone to help you, you're going to miss out on this, on this, and this, it's going to cost, cost you money here. It's going to be painful for you. Whereas mm. you hire <laughs> us, I can help reduce some of that pain because I will bear that burden for you. I will do this homework for you. I will, you know, kind of guide you and help introduce you to the right people, you know, like get, get you to vendors that I've worked with in the past that I know will do a good job because a lot of people, you know, pop up and say, oh yeah, I'm in a home inspector now. Or, you know, or they pop and say, hey, I'm a contractor now, or, mm -hmm. you know, or, hey, I do this now. And really they're not, you know, maybe not the best solution for that client, right? And then not only that, what is the client's problem? Like right now, for example, um, you know, I know interest rates just uh, came down, I think just the other day or, or this week or today maybe um, uh, for buying homes, but it's like, listen, I have people that need to move. Renting has its challenges, but, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe right now the renter advantage program like that we have might be a good solution for you as a bridge gap between today's interest rates and tomorrow's interest rates, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, but at least you get to pick the home today and get today's price <laughs> as right. opposed to tomorrow's price when, you know, people don't recognize the fact that, you know, when, if inventory continues to say compressed and all of a sudden interest rates drop, well, guess what? Housing prices aren't going to also drop. They are going to do the opposite. They're going to increase most likely. So it's like, that's equity gains for you, right? If you buy today and then you can close on your mortgage tomorrow for a price, you know today what that price is going to be, right? Like, so imagine having a crystal ball. We talk about this mm -hmm. all the time. It's like, if you do a renter advantage program today, I know what my purchase price of this home is going to be 12 months from now, 24 months from now, 36 months home from now, 36 months from now. Now I have a crystal ball from that perspective on what I'm going to pay. And then if the home price values go up guess what i've just gained that much more equity in my home right yeah so. <clears throat> does that work even uh, so jay powell uh they they pretty much said they're shooting for one two percent uh of inflation which would mean home prices inflate at one two percent um does the does that program still make sense if it's a two percent i mean after just seeing tw 20 30 percent over the last two years uh do you think it's still you're investing in that program for the future if it's a 2% increase over one year? Well, but I I think like it can still work for that person who one wants to to move today, but doesn't want to pay like, um, because we they never know, right? They always right. have these anticipated inflation rates or, or not just inflation, but equity rates, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, right? <laughs> we never know. But, you know, what about interest rates too? It's like buying today, if I was going sure. to buy today and I can save money by renting that home today and buying it tomorrow and getting a lower interest rate tomorrow, that's not a bad thing for me. Yeah. But right? No, I, I get it. And and the whole point is bring value to your customers and and help them out and and consult them and and find that pain. Zillow doesn't want pain because they want you the consumer coming back to Zillow. They don't want you to establish a relationship with 
uh, the consumer. They want the relationship with the consumer. And that's probably why the, the other piece of that, that's frictionless. They're going through Zillow and not through the agent. Kendall, yeah. super awesome to, to chat with you today. Um, and I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to come on and, and uh, do Ask the Expert with me. Oh, that's so kind. And before you um, in that, mm -hmm. I do want to make a point because someone's going to say this in the comments oh. about Renter Advantage program. The point isn't that the Renter Advantage program is the right solution for every client, right? Or all the time. The point is, is that you're having a conversation about the opportunities that they have, about the solutions, right? Whether it's, you know, buy before you sell, sell before you buy, Renter Advantage, you know, whatever an auction, you know, it's being able to have that consultation with the client and express to them, hey, here are a number of solutions for you that you otherwise wouldn't know about, but for talking to me. So Here's I just want to yeah. it's just cool. <laughs> understood. Understood. We went down the rabbit hole a little bit on that one specific tool, but yes, that's. Yeah, I understood. didn't want people to think like that's the tool. It's like, no, it's one of many tools. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much.